So good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's uh, Leaps and Bounds um, Festival panel discussion um, on live music touring. Um, my name is Lucy Joseph. I'm the Projects um, and Engagement um, Manager for the Live Music Office. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, mm -hmm. and pay respect to Elders past, present um, and emerging. Um, special thanks to Music Victoria and the City of Yarra for putting on this um, Leaps and Bounds Festival. Um, it, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that this will be recorded. So um, if anyone is uncomfortable with being included in that recording, you're um, free to jump out and um, you can access that recording via uh, the Music Victoria Facebook, I believe. Um, uh, Ash from Music Vic um, will um, update you on that. Um, so, uh, and a bit of more housekeeping. Um, before we actually be begin, um, I'd just like to ask that everyone keep their mics muted. Um, if you've got any questions, which we'd love to take during the discussion, um, just uh, shoot them through via the, um, the chat function um, and we'll keep an eye out for those um, and try to answer them as we're going along. And um, also we'll dedicate a bit of time at the end to, um, to some, some uh, Q and A's as well. Um, so yeah, again, look, thanks, thanks for being here everyone. Um, tonight we're lucky to have um, a group of absolute legends come and join us to discuss the future of touring in Australia. So. Um, I'd just like to quickly introduce um, everyone. So we have Matt Walters from Clara Gigs. Matt, you want to give us a wave? <laughs> um, Emily York um, from Penny Drop. Um, we have Gavin Yilmaz from Vita Artists. And Nicholas Greco from Untitled Group. Thanks, guys. So tonight's panel discussion is about the future of touring in Australia. Um, our topic um, kind of stipulates that while the future of touring hangs in the balance, um, we're here to, sh to share thoughts and ideas about the opportunities that that future might hold. So we, you know, we want to talk about how can promoters and festivals and agents and artists prepare for the post-COVID world um, and remain agile to the touring landscape um, that's constantly evolving. And look, I'm going to start this off by being a bit of a bummer. Um, apologies, everyone. But I think it's important that we're constantly examining exactly how COVID has um, affected the music industry. And we've got to paint a picture of the current state of play, which um, let me tell you is a real Jackson Pollock. Um, it's a bit of a mess if you don't get the art history reference. Um, these lovely people here tonight on the panel will attest to that. Um, it's been said before and it's worth saying again that these are truly unprecedented times for the industry. We've never had to consider before that um, what might happen if the very foundation on which the industry operates, that the consumer of live music um, is suddenly no longer in the equation. And, you know, almost overnight, um, an entire ecology um, was shut down in response to the spread of COVID with no long-term plan for how to help recover um, once the dust settles. So, and, you know, I'm sure as a lot of, a lot of us know, um, most of an artist's income comes from live performance and that has a flow on effect for the promoters and the festivals, the agents, the touring companies, um, venues, bar staff, stage, sound production, managers, bookers, and then hotels and restaurants and transportation and many others who, who all depend um, on the ability of those artists to tour, to physically get out on the road and travel from place to place to perform live to a real life audience, um, standing shoulder to shoulder. So um, a lot of the conversations about crisis management and recovery um, have focused on the artist first and, and then the venues. Um, so tonight I want this discussion to kind of be um, asking those same questions of, of the broader touring sector. So um, to get a clear idea of where we currently stand, I'd like to ask each of our um, panellists just to spend a few minutes talking about what life was like BC, um, you know, who they are, what they were doing, um, and then what the shutdown experience um, was like for them over the last kind of three months. Um, so Emily, um, do, do you want to kick off? Geez, my internet has been a little um, patchy. So um, also part of the uh, COVID-19 experience in full form here. Um, <laughs> I, 
I am, uh, so I work, I run a company called Penny Drop, which is, I guess, a kind of independent music business. Um, part of what I do is in international touring. So we bring artists from all around the world to tour across Australia and New Zealand. Um, we, I also am a programmer, so I uh, book both international and Australian talent uh, for events, um, mostly, yeah, uh, a, a big event called Melbourne Zoo Twilights in Melbourne, which is um, a summer uh, ser concert series um, held every January, February and March. Um, do some talent booking for the ABC. Um, yeah, lots, lots of bits and pieces. Um, so that was, that was in the before times. Um, currently I'm an avid television consumer. Um, I haven't had a manicure in about three months and, um, yeah, do a lot of thinking. <laughs> what, um, what was, what happened in, it's, it's, it was around March, right? But I feel like <laughs> most of the, um, the, the meltdown started happening. What was that like for yeah. you? It was quite interesting. We had a, um, we were in the middle of a tour. So we had New Order out um, in, in the country uh, March 13th. And we had a show at the Music Bowl in Melbourne, which, you know, we'd sold 12,000 tickets to. Um, the government announced on the Friday before that Saturday that the lockdown laws would take place as of the Monday. Um, so we really were in the eye of the storm, having to make really quick decisions, um, you know, live at, with a band in the country of, you know, not, not of small stature and, um, yeah, really, um, had, it was a, you know, profound sort of, um, not just a logistical issue, but kind of an ethical dilemma as well as to whether or not to yeah. gather, um, that many people during such a, a, a an intense moment um, in in one space, and you know, certainly not wanting to be the cause of any kind of super spread across the city. So um, that yeah, that that whole thing kind of really unfolded very much um, minute by minute for us, um, and was quite challenging. Yeah, yeah. And so the last kind of three months have just really like it sounds like a lot has really dropped off for you. So. Um, with the international touring stuff, it's just been, um, you know, the first, I think the first month was a real flurry of activity. I think people were just kind of um, not in denial, but just sort of trying to, you know, solve the problem. I think we're all really pragmatic um, problem solving people. That's sort of part of what you are if you're in this business. And so I think a lot of time was spent kind of going, oh, okay, we'll do it this way or we'll do this. And then I think everyone kind of pretty quickly was like, wait a second, there's no, um, there's no real solution in sight very quickly. So um, yeah, I think um, a lot of conversations, a lot of, um, you know, the sense of taking a step forward and then two steps back every, every day, just kind of feeling like you've, you've had some clarity around what you can do and then realizing that you in fact don't. And obviously the goalposts continue to change. Um, you know, day by day, really, we get new updates which kind of change um, mm. the terms with which we can operate or not operate. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, it's a real sort of a mix of um, a lot of stuff going on and then very little going on at the same time. There's definitely some uh, cognitive dissidence going on there. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, Gaben, did you want to um, jump in and tell us a bit about your experience, BC, and then... And then Meltdown? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, my name's Given, and I run an agency called Vida. Um, we mainly specialise in representing domestic uh, Australian talent, um, you know, uh, across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and, yeah, so I guess my role or the company's role is to, um, you know, secure touring routes and, and shows and do deals with, with promoters and venues and other talent buyers. And so I guess pre-COVID, you know, it was, it was obviously business as usual coming off the, the back of summer, which was, you know, uh, you know thankfully our, our biggest year across the agency. Um, you know, we had, um, to be honest, I actually lost count of how many shows that we had, but I just know from like, from the previous three years, it was like, it was basically our, our biggest year yet. And, and obviously we've seen a lot of growth across the roster and our, and our talent that we represent. So um, yeah, coming into March, you know, 
I guess their um, optimism was really high and, you know, thinking that, you know, if, if 2020 was going to be any, uh, sorry, 2019 was going to be any indication as to how 2020 was going to be, like everyone was feeling really good. And then obviously come, you know, I think it was uh, March 15th, you know, I guess that's sort of when that, that first sort of domino fell. And, um, and yeah, basically it was, it was a really odd experience um, for me because I actually got married on March 8th. And, um, and basically you know, we had a, a, quite a large wedding. Um, I was going to say the, uh, the uh, European roots, you know, sort of had a, so everyone, um, everyone was there. We had like, a, you know, just over 200 people attend my wedding. And then that following week, you know, my now wife and I we were sitting in Hamilton Island and I'm, um, you know, just on a post wedding getaway and I'm starting to get email after email being like, Hey, we've got to cancel. We've got to cancel. Cause I, I switched off my emails. to you know, to try and get off, you know, get off and disconnect. <laughs> And all of a sudden, getting switch a, off your emails. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I started getting these text messages from from um, from our agents and you know from admin and all the rest, being like, hey, you know, we have to shift shows, we've got to shift shows, and so then basically I switched back on, and then it was like, bang, all of a sudden, like everything from March all the way through to October that we had locked in, like you know, it was well over 150 shows essentially where we either had to reschedule or, or cancel majority of them just because you know, I guess we're, we're aiming to shift our, you know, artist shows into 2021 now, but yeah. yeah, it was, it was definitely a surreal experience because, you know, obviously, you know, no, one, no one saw this coming and it was sort of like, you know, we were the first to, to really sort of get hit hard in a sense where like industry shut down essentially. So I guess that was, that was the experience there pre coming into, you know, current times, but yeah. yeah. So like, I guess our focus has just been, you know, uh, shifting our artists um, shows at the moment. Yeah, cool. Th thank you. Um, uh, Nick, um, I wanted to hear from you next about what, um, yeah, what, what life was like BC and then, um, yeah, what the last kind of three months have been like for you. Yeah, um, I'm one of the five owners of Untitled Group. We're um, an independent music company that's doing a little bit of everything. We've got um, a management arm, a label arm, an agency arm. We do domestic and international touring, um, but our, our biggest core of our company is definitely our events. We do over 200 events annually, um, which is over about 250,000 tickets a year. Um, our biggest events are you know, Beyond the Valley, Grapevine, uh, Pitch, Ability Festival, and we've, we just came off a, um, a really, really strong summer. Um, we actually had Pitch Music and Arts just the week before all of this sort of hit we just managed to come in unscathed from that um and you know that that week after i had a client of mine allies who was supposed to be performing at the grand prix i think it was on march 15th or march 16th and she was ready to go like morning off everyone's at the gates and we saw on the news that they um had to can the entire grand prix festival something we just didn't think was even possible in our industry and that sort of when all the dominoes started to fall for us and this became a really a real thing we had to deal with yeah was um i think uh, i lost our gig um i lost my gig has the last tally was 340 million um lost across the industry like is that um you know do you do you consider yourself part of that equation yeah definitely it was actually like hard to keep up with the amount of gigs we were postponing and cancelling like it, it was pretty grim and upsetting those, mm. those first few weeks with the amount of money that was lost. Um, mm. And, I, you know, everyone was in the same boat, I think, for the first time ever in the music industry. So it was, um, it was nice to be able to call up people and just ask what's going on. Everyone have the same, uh, same view and be in the same boat. Yeah. Matt, um, what's your experience been like with, um, with Pile of Gigs? before and now over the last kind of three months? Um, uh, so just with Parler, it's a technology platform that makes it really easy for artists to book in house shows with their fans, predominantly house shows. Um, we're almost six years old um, as a company, um, have facilitated a couple of thousand shows um, are all around the world, but mostly in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and in terms of where we were before, um, you know, we, Q1 this year, um, just before the pandemic really landed, was our best quarter ever. Um, we were growing um, pretty rapidly um, and, you know, seeing sort of artists with better and better profiles jumping on board. 
Um, and so, yeah, we were high-fiving in a big way <laughs> just before um, this happened. Um, and then like a lot of the other members of the panel, um, myself and the other founders, we spent a couple of weeks, a um, couple of grueling weeks rescheduling or cancelling shows. Um, hundreds of shows that were on sale f so far for 2020 into 2021. Um, and thankfully, um, we only had to cancel um, about a quarter of those shows. We've been able to reschedule most of them. Um, and most of them are fourth quarter into 2021. Um, although um, now it's been interesting. I mean, I, um, there's lots of self-employed people on this panel, but I felt like I haven't really had a holiday since I started this business. And um, <laughs> the holiday, the, the sort of month off was sort of forced on me. And so there were some positives that came out of that, um, forced to switch off. Um, but um, now the last few weeks, we've started to see um, lots of being booked in again, um, which is which is amazing. Um, so artists are jumping on board and 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 booking in um, mini tours of fans' homes, um, and often it's locally to them. So so they're driving for the shows because they're not you know we're not sure how travels going to go. Um, and so we've had to put in place you know our COVID nineteen safety protocol and make sure our terms and conditions are up to scratch and all that sort of stuff. Um, and answering lots of, lots of new questions. Um, and yeah. when you're not a virologist or an epidemiologist, it's pretty hard. But um, yeah, so we're thrilled that it's starting again um, for us. And obviously we've always specialized in small shows. So we're hopeful that we can play a big part in the rebuilding effort. Um, yeah, yeah, I wanted to, um, I wanted to get to that. Like we, so, you know, the last three months have been um, fairly dire for, for everyone involved right across the industry. This is certainly the first time that um, this has been like an industry-wide um, effect that's been felt. So, um, but, but yeah, now we're in, this, um, we're in this transitional period where the government is, um, like has, has indicated that they're going to start lifting restrictions. Um, you know, regular venues are allowed to have shows with four metre square um, distancing. And then um, for the larger shows, like the 40,000 cap venues, um, allowed to operate at 25%, um, which has in turn, you know, we've seen um, a lot of um, declarations that uh, gigs are back, um, you know, and, and there's been venues um, like the Gov in, um, uh, in Adelaide, which um, opened on uh, Sunday for an audience, I think, of about 10 people um, uh, who were all selected Adelaide. by ballot. Say again, sorry? I said that's normal for Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired! <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, you know, this is all kind of seemingly good news, right? But um, I, I wanted to dig down with each of you guys about like what the reality of these transitional measures looks like for you, you know, how, how you've responded to them. Um, Emily, uh, you know, what kind of, what impact do, do um, these current social distancing measures where it's a bit in between have on your work? Like is, you know, how difficult is it to respond to, um, to them as they're changing so quickly? Yeah. Um, it doesn't, yeah, it's, it's, it certainly doesn't. I mean, my, in terms of the international touring that we do, it really has zero impact at all. Mm. Like we can't, like the fact that you can have 20 people at a 400 cap venue has absolutely no impact on my, my ability to do my business at all. Um, yeah. So um, that's a real, it's interesting. And I think those things are really, that they're the things that sort of concern me most right now is this sort of, this sort of rhetoric of like, you know, business as usual and for people outside of the industry, it just seems like, oh, so you can do your job now. Like you can do, you know, venues are open and it's like, well, actually, no, we can't. Like that's just not how it works. And obviously that's for me, obviously with some of the other people on the panel, that's slightly different. And what Parler do is obviously providing an alternative there. But, um, you know, for us to, I need borders open. I need to know how much flight's <laughs> going to be. I need to know how long quarantine's going to be. I need yeah. to know how much a flight from Sydney to Perth's going to cost in the, you know, after Corona time. Um, there are so many questions that we still have unanswered. Um, and totally. we just, yeah, we, it doesn't even scratch the surface. And then, you know, in terms of the programming stuff, again, it's so much of what we do is, is, um, 
is made up of international touring. So um, if we're not doing internationals, okay, so what, how does the budget change? What's the ticket price going to look like? What's, you know, just slews of questions. Um, so yeah, lots of, um, uh, of funny conversations with sort of normal people that um, sort of read the headlines and sort of assume, and, and you know, the concern of course being that the government um, just assume we can all go back to work whereas the impact is it has to be staggered because it, the way it impacts different people is completely different depending on what you do in the industry um yeah yeah that's right it's it's totally tricky like nick has has that been um your experience like is it it is how helpful is this kind of incremental lifting like for your survival like is it is it worth it at this point um I mean, we're used to putting on like, you know, Beyond the Valley and some other shows up to 25,000 person shows. So when we're talking about 100 person gigs and trying to make that financially viable, it's not really. Um, in terms of what we do as a business, we've sort of said in whatever capacity we can, we're going to put on some shows for our, for our audience. Like we've put, been putting on live stream shows uh, and they've been really well received and We've been working on 100 person gigs at multiple venues across Victoria and seeing how they would look and budgeting them up. Um, and then with the previous round of restrictions, the, the, the drive in concert, the drive in um, cinema um, was allowed to operate. So we started working on a drive in concert yeah, series. Yeah, I want to I wanna get into that um, a bit for like how that's all developed. But, um, but I, like, I just wanted to just stick on. Um, like how like this transitional um, mm. period and it's the weird incremental lifting of um, these measures kind of mm. uh, affects or isn't helpful at all for everyone given like is you know uh, do artists want to perform in this in these in this environment is that your experience at the moment what kind of conversations have you mm. been having with with them at the moment uh, so we're trying to keep like pretty open lines of communication with them artists managers and i guess all the other stakeholders in in the artists that we um like artist teams that we represent um so yeah obviously everyone's very eager to um to get back into the circuit uh, by far touring is the most um i guess um you know profitable sect of a, of an artist's career um so you know it, it's it's vital to their survival so um you know uh, getting out there is definitely like you know uh, i guess what what everyone's really sort of keen on doing um, as for like sort of the incremental rollback, like it, it's really a case by case sort of um, basis. So like a lot of the artists that are sort of in that 100 to 250 ticket mark, like, you know, we're looking at strategies now to, to see like, okay, if we can do these size shows in the next, um, say, you know, three to six months, then what does this look like? Whether it be like, you know, um, you know, young lines do a stripped back more acoustic type show that's seated opposed to being like you know at you know 500 packs show at you know at a venue or something along those lines or you know uh, a sit down dinner with um milan ring or or, or you know so and so but you know again it, it really depends on like the size of the artist because you know for example like you know um like my biggest client peking duck we had plans to go back into a uh, 5,000 cap venues um, in September, which look like right now, it, it you know, th there isn't any plans for us to go, go into those venues in September. We've, we've entirely changed their touring strategy for the next two years, um, as of this week, um, basically, but like, you know, uh, you know, I, there's no way that I could see 300 people in chairs at a Peking Duck concert. You know what I mean? Like it, it's just, it's just not going to happen. And, and similarly with like Kwame or, or Nixon or whatnot, because, they bring a lot of energy to, I guess, um, a lot of energy to the show and, and people, you know, people thrive on that. So they want to get in there. So it's really going to be like a case by case basis and, and trying to see whether, you know, what's suitable for which artists and, you know, how we can get them out on the circuit as, as quick as um, possible. But the points that Emily made before were, were extremely important as well. Like what is flying going to look like on the other side of this, you know, because, Obviously, you know, let's not go into um, economics, but um, I was going to say like Virgin going into administration is going to give Qantas a big up, upper hand in like, you know, the flight market. So like, you know, is it going to cost more for domestic touring? So does that mean that, you know, that agents are going to be wanting more money from promoters? 
to play their shows or is it going to cost more for an artist to tour? So these are all things that like we really have no idea yet and we're probably not going to have any idea until for the next probably, I would say, at the very earliest two or three months because, you know, we're still sort of in, in this grey area and, you know, I'm still sort of sceptical as to how quick they're going to allow people to congregate even though the rhetoric is like, oh, hey, you know, as Emily said, business as usual, but it's not business as usual for us. And, you know, mm. are they going to let 5,000 people get into a Horton Pavilion with a chance that maybe one person may still be carrying the, um, mm. you know, carrying it or something like that. So again, it's extremely speculative right now. Mm. Yeah. That thing about um, like uh, audience expectation as well, you know, that's, mm -hmm. um, because all of this happened so quickly, there hasn't been enough time, I think, for the audience to rethink about how they engage with live music. And so, um, so you know, while all of this is kind of, you know, as you're saying, that the, the future is certainly very uncertain and, and it's evolving sometimes on a daily basis. It's super hard to keep up with. Um, uh, but, but, you know, we're a creative industry, we're full of creative people. And so um, there's people are responding to these, this whole situation in kind of innovative ways. So um, Nick, I wanted to come back to you about um, the drive-in, which was um, just announced this week, I believe. Mm. Congratulations. Um, yeah. As this, as this um, alternative way of still engaging with live music, um, but also responding to the circumstances that we're currently in. Like, can you tell us about how that, like how you came to develop that, what was involved there? Mm, um, we've been working on it for about six weeks now, probably just before the, um, the drive-in movies were allowed with, the, with those restrictions. Um, you know, we saw the concept working really well overseas in Europe and in the UK a little bit and in America and thought it's probably only a matter of time before uh, it's allowed here. Um, we were initially uh, speaking to Melbourne Airport about running the gigs at the airport there because they've been um, decimated with having no international or domestic travel. Um, and then it ended up working really well for us with Flemington, who's an event partner of ours. And there's been a lot of hoops to jump through to make it a concept that is safe, uh, that fits all the health measures, and that is also financially viable as well um but everyone's been really really receptive and all our usual artist teams and booking partners site teams production teams everyone jumped at the chance of working on a concept in this weird time even though it, the, the thought of a drive-in concert even just 15 weeks ago would have been laughed at and now it's something that i think is very much um you know in the in the focus of people is that uh, like the the audience enthusiasm is that something like that you're um what kind of read are you getting on that at the moment yeah when we um announce any of our tours or shows we we do a pre-sale sign up process and it allows us to judge how um how that's being received and in the space of 24 hours we've had 30,000 people sign up for for tickets for this and there's definitely not that many available so um we're, yeah. yeah we're quite excited to get it on sale I think it's um, pre-sales on Thursday and then uh, general on sale is going to be on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. How, like, how do you think the, um, like, uh, the audience, um, like, how do you think that it, it's, it's weirdly like more of an intimate experience now, um, like in a different way, rather than, you know, being in a huge crowd of people standing shoulder to shoulder, um, you're in your own space, um, but still in public, like, yeah, what's, did you have to kind of think about that in terms of um, how you designed the event, like the technology that goes into it, that kind of thing? Yeah, there's, um, there's been pretty strict health measures in place. Like everyone needs to have their names and numbers written down. There's temperature checks, um, there's hand sanitizer everywhere. We've got a toilet per row of cars so that we can track all of that as well. And, and all that stuff is so, it's very expensive for us to implement um so like that's that's the other thing that sort of has our focus for all our other events is all these costs that are going to come back uh end of year as well yeah, yeah. um so and, it's, yeah sorry keep yeah and I, I um yeah everyone's going to stay in their car for for this as well they can't can't leave their cars and i sort of think people have been isolated for so long now they need a bit of a, a midway step before jumping back into being shoulder to shoulder in a, a normal gig environment anyway yeah 
Nick, yeah. do you listen on the radio? Is that how it works? Yeah, sorry, it's through the FM transmitter. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, so you you guys are so impressive, Nick. Like I just, you know, I feel like I've spent three months just lying down and, um, Nick and everyone at Untitled Group has <laughs> sort of like run around the world a hundred times and back and reinvented things and been, you know, just incredible, um, commitment to <laughs> providing entertainment to people. So I just want to, um, acknowledge that for a second, how incredible. Oh, thank you. Are. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure not um, making any money doing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's, you know, that's the other question, I guess, is, um, is it worth it at the moment? Like is, is, um, what's the drive for doing all of this now? Um, you know, is it to maintain an audience? Is it to, um, you know, keep the sector kind of afloat as well? Like what's, what's your thinking behind that? Yeah, a little bit of both of those. Um, it's really important for us to maintain an audience and have entertainment for our audience. Like we put on a lot of day parties throughout the year when we don't have our festivals on and you know, we're quite well known for that. And we've got a pretty, um, pretty, pretty solid crowd that comes to most of those. So it's putting something on for those. Initially, it was the live streams. Um, we put on two live stream events. And then now it's the drive-in concert series, and we've had we've had messages from some of our, our regular Untitled event fans saying thank you for putting on these events. And then also, um, it's work for our production crew, our site teams, um, our box office staff, people that um, are self-employed who can't get JobKeeper who really need this money to survive. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned live streaming, Emily. I wanted to ask you about what you know what role live streaming has played for you, if anything at all, at this point. What were your thoughts about that? Um, I think it was it's super tricky for me in terms of the artists I work with are all international, and there, yeah, we definitely had um, some thoughts around that, but sort of just kept running into these dead ends of like why you know the the traditional structures where you know we play a role in an American band's career in Australia just sort of no longer became relevant because it was like you know if an American band is going to do a live stream they're not going to just do it for Australia in which case you know they're going to do something for the you know it just it, it became completely redundant um I mean it's you know it's certainly been entertaining and I've I've participated as a viewer and um enjoyed yeah parts of it and um I think there is a lot of talk at the moment of these sort of hybrid models of um you know having people in real life in the room that buy tickets and then um the rest of the tickets are sold to people that watch on zoom and I mean, I have a lot of ethical issues with that. I think that this is creating a real sense of exclusivity and, you know, what are we saying? Like, if you've got money, you get to be there in your life. And if you don't have as much money, you, you know, you have to experience it um, online. I mean, I think that that's super tricky. Um, mm. But also, you know, I guess we're at a point where if that is paying some bills for people and keep, you know, I, I, I get it. Like, we need to kind of think that through a little bit. Um, but I also wonder who the people would be that could afford the really expensive tickets and if they're the 10 people you want being your audience, <laughs> if that makes a really dud show. Um, but yeah, so I think, um, I think it's been a really essential, um, tool during this time mm -hmm. and where it goes from here. I mean, I want to, I, you know, I hope that it's not, we don't need to lean on it too much in the near future. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think Matt, Matt, are you back with us? I think you're having tech problems before. I am. Sorry, I froze. That's all right. No, that's good. You came back right in time for me to ask you about. Um, I didn't miss much. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you about, um, yes, what, what, um, what role, um, you know, parlor gigs plays in, um, like in this, in this period that we're in now, this weird transitional period, um, I read somewhere that um, uh, that my, Michael Chug had said um, that you know the immediate future of touring was um, might look like smaller um, gigs and more of them. Um, the, the, like, how does that kind of align with with um, the the parlor platform? The fact that it is always small gigs, that intimate experience. What's like, what's that been like? Um, well, before COVID nineteen. Our platform um, allowed artists to fill in off days. So if they were maybe touring in a new market where 
um, they stood to lose money from travel or, or whatever to get to get going in that market, they would use our platform to fill in off days and make extra revenue. Um, or maybe an artist, a good example is an artist like Chris Cheney from the Living End is writing a new record and you know sitting around for six months, six months is off cycle and wants to use the platform to go out and play 15 shows and make X amount. So, so before we, we've been this kind of tool to sort of fill in the gaps essentially for artists to keep the revenue flowing. Um, and, and now it, it feels like, um, you know, that people already just having watched what's happening in the last few weeks, um, artists are booking in full tours, um, almost suburb to suburb, which is new. Um, uh, so yeah, focusing on those small shows and not every artist that we work with is like, let's go. Some are like, I'm having two years off, um, totally. And, and then others are, you know, obviously there's a, there's a real financial need there, um, to, to start earning again. Um, and you know, I think those that, um, product provider, it's as safe as it can be. Those that do take that step, um, are going to keep their fan base engaged, are going to continue to grow their fan base because so Pal are all Pala gigs are always private shows and it's one fan selling tickets to their friends. So it does grow the artist fan base in a really organic way. Um, mm. I feel like I've lost track of the question, Lucy. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's all right. I was, but I, um... One thing, actually, I wanted to talk about Andrew Watt's comment. Hi, Andrew, by the way. Yeah. Um, that, so our, our tickets um, have always been at least 50% more than venue prices. Um, so it's always been a premium item. The, the average ticket price in the first quarter this year for us was 75 Australian dollars, thereabouts. Um, so it does um, attract a particular type of punter that can afford it, certainly. Um, and for us, it's folks that are 35 and older and have their own home and often going out to live shows is is difficult because they have kids and all that sort of stuff. So that, that's a pretty common user for us. Um, it's been really interesting to see artists like Ali Bada use Parler and have younger fans applying. Um, yeah. And, you know, keen to sort of have the experience. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think for, for me, the, the thing that I'm relieved about, um, and I, I'm, I'm tentatively relieved because obviously it, it is a, sh the, ground keep shifting and you know if, if we're shut down again then that changes everything but um i was relieved to see fans out there wanting to pay for live music um and wanting to buy a ticket and and pay you know for a show um that is a, an enormous relief because the fear i think on our end is we're always going to have artists that want to play these shows is whether or not there's going to be any demand for that supply on the other side yeah um, yes, I, I think uh, maybe you're having tech problems before when Nick was saying that um, that they how, Nick say again how many um, uh, how many t uh, p audiences you had interested in the um, drive-in gig. Um, sorry, what do you mean by audiences? Uh, so you were saying there's um, you had about thirty thousand. Um, oh, people pre sign up to it. Sorry, pre sales. Yeah, yeah. Oh. See, we had about thirty thousand. In the space of about 24 hours, sign up mm. for tickets. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I was um, uh, reading. Um, there was a uh, a survey of about 23,000 um, people um, conducted recently, which um, said that about 87% of people would um, would go to a venue straight away, uh, go to a gig straight away if they could. So I think you know we're pretty confident that the um, the audience demand is there. It's just a matter of um, when rather than um, rather than how. Um, Given, I wanted to ask you about um, just going uh, off what Matt was talking about um, in terms of like the smaller gigs, the smaller opportunities. Is that something that artists like that you've seen in your um, your ex your recent chats lately about um, you know opportunities for artists to still be performing? What kind of role does that? the smaller venue now play at the moment? Um, yeah, so definitely, uh, I guess there was a really big transitional period with um, a lot of the roster shifting into, into larger venues come, I guess, this period right now, like Q2 2020, um, especially like, you know, across that sort of mid tier with artists shifting from like, you know, 250 into 500 packs room and 500 
Axe Room into a thousand and then, um, you know, and, and beyond basically. And I think the, I guess the nature of the conversation has, has come back to be like, well, look, with the uncertainty in the market, I think we're going to have to start looking at potentially going back um, into smaller venues um, because I guess we can get into them a bit quicker. And, you know, again, so, you know, it just, again, it always comes down to the conversation with what artists goals are and I guess what, what they really want to do, because, you know, again, say for argument's sake, like, you know, if, come March 2021, um, like we might be able to go straight back into a metro theatre or a forum or whatever it may be, or we could we can do a show at, um, high, at Melbourne Arena. Like it just, but you know, but I think the appetite to shift into smaller venues is, um, is definitely there. And just um, hitting Jaden on his, um, on his yeah. question there, like with reduced capacities is definitely gonna come with reduced artist fees. Um, I think um, that that's, you know, supply and demand and also just the, the general, um, I guess, uh, you know, sort of nature of the, of the business where like, you know, no one's going to have the budgets that they had last summer because every, everyone's essentially bleeding money now trying to keep themselves afloat. And, you know, I feel like, I guess, all the panellists here, you know, we work in an, a very independent um, stead, you know, we don't really have a, a you know, huge um, investors sort of pumping pumping capital into the company. So our job essentially right now is to, to keep afloat and continuing to advise our clients, stakeholders and everyone else that we work with, you know, as to like, you know, how we can modify, modify our business structures to weather this storm. And, you know, thereby that that's going to come with providing artists with advice to saying like, look, we want to get back in there. We need to support our promoters. Like you're not going to get this fee, even though I got it for you last year, we're going to have to take a step back. But, you know, again, still very case by um, uh, case basis. And I, I don't know, I, I'd be very keen to hear um, uh, Nick's point of view here as well. And, and as well as, uh, you know, um, I was gonna say everyone else's where like, I think like ticket prices for summer festivals, do you think that they're gonna go um, stay the same as last year or down? Nick, I did you think, wanna comment on that? Yeah, yeah I, I think with limited capacity, you know, as you said, it's sort of mm -hmm. supply and demand for us to be able to put these events on the costs are pretty fixed. They don't really change. So we're going to have to look at uh, increasing the ticket price or maybe putting shows back to back on a Saturday and Sunday rather than, you know, we, we just do one show previously. Maybe we're going to do two shows. And mm -hmm. then over the course of, the, of both shows, artists, production, site teams, everyone can sort of make the money they would normally make, but it just um, takes a longer period of time. Totally. Um, and yeah, I, you know, um, I realise that we, we actually don't um, have an artist on the panel tonight. So if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to jump in there and um, offer any insight, um, yeah, that'd be great by all means. Nick, sure how, how are you, what, how are you feeling about, um, and yeah, I guess everyone really, um, the, if it's only Australian talent, um, what is going to happen with all the festivals pulling from, like, how do you, yeah, I imagine artists aren't going to want to play every single festival, but everybody's going to make up for this huge loss of income from the last year. So you've got from, from the artist side, it's going to be tricky to make those decisions, but also from the festival perspective, um, how, how does that, what's your approach? I'm so curious how, yeah, how that's going to affect the way you book things. Yeah, it's um, it's been really interesting. Like, I find booking our summer festival sometimes is like an episode of Game of Thrones because there's just so much politics at play and so much going on. Um, and you know, we've got the added complexity here of only having a small pool of artists and still wanting our events to stand out and not appear the same as the festival that's going to be on the week after us and taking from our ticket sales. Um, so it's it's proving interesting um we've still got some international talent that is locked in to some of our major events that we've we've been booking our, our shows since like november last year so we have internationals locked in um we're, we're going to set cutoff dates for those like i'm i'm holding out to see what happens and you know if if we can get them into the country our events will look really different to a festival that just has domestic talent um but we'll have to see what happens 
And that would be with the quarantine, you just sort of embrace the, the costs of, well, not embrace, that's a very positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you would just factor in, yeah, two weeks of paying for a hotel and, you know. Yeah, there's, there's been a few artists that have approached us who, um, who love coming to Australia over the summer and they're prepared to come in, chill for two weeks and then do their four or five shows over New Year's and, you know, quarantine again when they go home because it's it's a decent amount of money that they can make over that period getting a few shows in all around the country. They know that they're quarantining at the Ibis at Tullamarine, yeah. right? <laughs> but that's cool, right? Yeah, no, we, we've definitely left that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be an interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> there's um there's a couple of um uh good comments coming in from our audiences about um yeah about how do we uh how do we set the expectation with audiences around ticket pricing like what do you think the industry can do to effectively um get that messaging out uh, i was just gonna say so <laughs> i feel like um just with and again i have a very niche set of experience um ticket prices always being in large inflated at 50% at least more you know more and again so like just as an example an artist like um and Andrew Stockdale another rock and roller from Wolf Mother Users Pilot is 120 Australian dollars a ticket um with a minimum capacity of 50 um and we've never had a, a fan of his not understand that that is reasonable um considering that he's playing for fewer people um, so I feel like the economics do land pretty naturally for people. I'm sure there might be people that are um, viewing this that disagree with me, but um, generally speaking, people understand that even a well-known artist, um, seemingly well-known artist needs um, for it to work, um, for the numbers to work, yeah. Yeah, and that, you know, that then leads to um, a valuing of Australian artists, which, um, you know, I think a lot of people would, would agree that it's, um, this is one of the biggest silver linings is that um, this focus on um, Australian artists is um, needed and welcomed by a lot of people. So, um, but do you, like, do you think that, um, uh, like, obviously the intimacy of these smaller gigs, um, um, you know, audiences might be willing to spend money on, but um, what what does you know this kind of impending recession that we're heading into actually mean for the audience's capability of actually spending money? Like that's that's kind of the the um, broader picture that I want to think about here is um, if we get out of the um, the frying pan and into the fire of um, a longer recession, what does that you know how? How do you want to kind of navigate through that? That's something that like I've been like sort of watching really closely and I guess like, you know, speculating on my end where it, like obviously uh, Josh Frydenberg announced that we are technically in a recession right now. It's going to be announced in the next quarter. Like I'm so keen to see how like essentially a recession is going to impact, you know, like I guess people's interest in you know, spending their money on ticket prices and uh, sorry, spending money on tickets and what that, you know, where that leaves prices and, and, and all the rest. Cause you know, discretionary spending is going to, yeah, that's essentially where, you know, I guess that's where um, ticket money is allocated from and, you know, it, like recession and, you know, decreased discretionary, discretionary spending goes hand in hand. So like, are people still going to have that, you know, 80 bucks to go and see a, a premium concert ticket or, or whatever it may be. So that's, you know, sort of something that I've had at the back of my mind as to like, okay, you know, if we do go into recession, are people going to, you know, be so keen to start spending bulk money on going shows every single weekend or are they going to pick one or two every month where it's like, you know, because, you know, it's their favourite artist or whatnot. But, you know, mm -hmm. I think that, I think that's going to be like, that'll be the next sort of conversation of this nature, I think, is how, how the recession is going to impact the live music sector outside of, um, yeah, outside of um, COVID. Yeah. So I, I think we're kind of moving towards, um, you know, this, uh, a discussion about, so post COVID, what is that? Like, when does it start? What, what are the realities for the gigs post, um, post COVID? So, um, you know, uh, the ability of the audience to spend money on, um, tickets, that's one thing. Um, I wanted to, yeah, get an idea from all of you, um, about, um, you know, what do you think post COVID looks like? Um, and, 
you know, within that world, what are some things that you want to see changed that existed previously? We're now kind of, you know, I should, I should kind of start this positively by saying that we're experiencing literally the worst case scenario here. And I feel like if we, you know, if we bounce back from this, then, then, um, then we'll be, you know, we'll be more prepared for other challenges, having been through the biggest of them all. Um, so, um, Emily, I might start with you just to um, get your thoughts about um, what does post-COVID look like ideally for you and um, what are some things that you'd like to use this opportunity to change, improve for, for the touring sector? Yeah, I mean, I think a big thing I've been thinking about is how unsustainable our industry is on an environmental level. I think the way we're doing things is just, you know, wildly um, messed up given we are actually facing a climate crisis, which is something that we've become very swept up with the COVID crisis, but we're sort of forgetting there's this sort of longer term impending crisis that we really haven't been given an, enough attention to. And so being stuck here in Australia, um, what can we do to be thinking about more sustainable ways to run shows, to tour, to travel? You know, maybe we shouldn't be flying everywhere. Maybe we shouldn't be bringing out as many artists from overseas as we are. Maybe we need to find a, you know, a regional touring circuit that actually is viable here. I think that's, you know, a really, like, I would love to see some money and infrastructure go into um, finding ways to do like, you know, legitimate driving tours where we can, you know, as long as I don't have to do the driving um, and it's just the band. Um, but, you know, just to sort of, um, I think we need to rethink a lot of that stuff because, you know, there's a point where that stuff's not going to be able to be happening anyway. So why don't we use that time? I think also um, thinking a lot about um, accessibility during this time. Um, I think if there's going to be money being um pumped into venues and festivals um, to keep us all afloat. I, I would love to think that we can use this time to be thinking about better access for um, people with disabilities um, or people that are financially less um, ahead than others. I think that that could also be worth really thinking about now um, and finding just, yeah, really sort of start assessing um, our values as an industry rather than you know um like let's get back to normal let's get back to normal which i understand but you know can we kind of bring some new insights um to that totally matt did you want to did you want to um follow on from that um yeah i mean i guess to me um a, con a contraction has already happened and with a recession we see our industry downsize inevitably right as depressing as that is um, and the new um, way that people do businesses, I think, will have to be much leaner, um, probably use more technology, um, be more efficient in, in new ways um, uh, and, and, in, and more environmentally friendly as well. Um, it's just, it's really interesting having, um, with Parler as a technology tool, what it does is it gauges the demand for artists um, wherever, the, wherever their fans are. So, um, data-driven touring is still not very widely used. Um, mm. And when you use data to tour, um, you can do it in a really lean way, in a cost-efficient way. Um, and so I just, I feel like with that lean, um, you know, if you want to stay in the business attitude, I feel like people will be um, uh, a, a lot more efficient um, in, in the wake of this. And I, and I guess, like, and I don't know, again, I don't know how this works, but I guess once there's a vaccine that, and everyone's vaccinated, then things kind of can go back to, to, to normal with people going to shows. But, yeah, the, the fear is, like, what, what shape is the industry in when that time comes, you know, mm. in a couple mm. of years? I was um, uh, reading about, like, some other kind of... Um, fundamental like structures in the in the touring industry that might um you know that might be able to change um you know things like uh um you know uh session band um session uh members um are often retained um can we emulate that for um you know crew production staff as well things like that i'd, I'd like to nick do you have um like 
have you been thinking about those kind of things in your world? Um, a little bit, probably more so on like, say, say how some of the deals are structured. There's been a lot of conversation around how can we as promoters wear less risk. Okay, every time we put on one of these festivals, um, we pretty much put everything you own on the, on the line to get these events up and running. And is there a way that we can renegotiate these deals so that uh, you know artists get bonuses on on based on the success of the events? Um, so I think that might be a bit of a focus across the board. Yeah. We, we um, had a question here from um, someone from the audience saying, do you think that exclusivity clauses with artists at festivals um, slash shows will be relaxed looking forward or do you think they will be more prominent, assuming that there'll be no international acts for some time? We've, we've found it's a bit of both. There's been some acts we've been negotiating for New Year's where the exclusivity clauses um, are lifted and there's some that aren't. And I think it just comes down to the artist fee and factoring that in. If the artist wants to play multiple shows, then they, they realize that they can't demand the same fee as if they were totally exclusive to our events. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was gonna say, I've, I've experienced that exact same sort of thing on the flip side, on the agent side, every single uh, festival that, you know, that we've discussed, you know, I guess acts to, you know, to be a part of, you know, all of them have come with exclusivity clauses, even though a, a lot of words circulated that are oh, that they'd be relaxed and, and all the rest. But, you know, again, it, it's always been a case by case basis. You know what I mean? You, you, if you have a, an act that's sort of, you know, in that sort of mid tier, then obviously it's a little bit more, um, I was going to say, uh, it's going to be a little bit more loose than say, for example, one of, you know, beyond the valleys or falls festivals or whoever's headliners, they're not going to, you know, be like, Hey, yeah, go play every festival that there is. So again, case by case. Hopefully um, the one thing we could have achieved after this is some kind of collective spirit to keep the thing going. And I think that, you know, that's what we're going to rely on is agents being more reasonable then, you know, venue, or the whole ecosystem for lack of a better word, will just need to just work a little bit more, um, you know, less competitively with each other and just see this yeah. as, um, you know, in order for this whole thing to work, everyone is going to have to make some compromises and maybe change the way they've been working um, so that the promoters aren't carrying all the risk. You know, it can't be left to the promoters to have to, like, get this thing running again and, and take all of that on. That's just not, that's just not an option anymore. So hopefully, and we're certainly seeing um, a real coming together of people um, to kind of advocate with government, you know, there's um, Ben Thompson's, um, there's a couple of people involved, sorry, Save Our Scene and, and Leaf, I think you say, L-E-I-F, yes. I don't know how you pronounce it, but yeah. you know, I think we're seeing more than ever, I think we've been a really fractured bunch, like we're probably quite useless at like, you know, getting together and advocating as an industry. And I think that could be a really um, interesting, can you hear my cat screaming in the background? <laughs> <laughs> more pet right content. Now. I've always yeah. been saying this. <laughs> anyway, I think that's yep. kind of very hopeful and, um, and, and cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I wanted to um, touch more on, um, uh, yeah, like the, the government advocacy side of things um, because uh, there's a lot of, like, regulations that need to change, new, uh, regulations that need to be thrown out, new ones that need to be brought in. Um, like, I don't know if, if you guys um, have any thoughts about... Um, what governments can do local like all levels of government local state federal um you know what um what kind of work can be done there to to um help this kind of post covid world or anyone from the audience even i should actually note at this point that um, i'm totally happy to take um like if anyone wants to unmute and, and ask any direct questions um by all means or if you had any um you know, thoughts, insight that you wanted to put to the group, um, by all means, you're absolutely invited to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't speak cat, so. Yeah. Oh my God, people <laughs> are thinking like, Are you your speaking. cat hungry, Emily? <laughs> 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 Please don't call the authorities. I swear <laughs> I treat her like. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Lucy, on the government stuff, um, 
I, I, it's interesting, this first wave of stimulus um, has been, you know, as an independent, small independent business, um, has it's been really encouraging and we've been very grateful um, that we've been able to get a few grants um, and and obviously the JobKeeper stuff um, and other other and other measures. But yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about at the bailout thing and following it in the in the media and wondering what shape that takes. Um, you know, who who stands to benefit the most? How how, how a system like that can work um, and and whether or not it happens at all. I mean, I. I Maybe I'm keen to ask the others what they think, but to me, it has to happen. It's just what shape um, it takes. And it has to apply to, I think, all parties. I think we just want to make sure whatever's going on that um, that no one is left behind. And I think yeah. you know, the beginning of JobKeeper was such a, you know, that was so stressful for so many people who didn't know if they qualified. And, you know, mm. I know people that have spent thousands of dollars getting accountants to get them JobKeeper um, or, you know, people that are, you know, just slipping through the cracks, like, you know, they're, they're um, on, you know, they're self-employed or they're sole traders, but don't employ people. And, you know, there were just all these loopholes that everybody has to try and like work out. And um, it just, you know, we have, and to be fair, we have a really nuanced, weird industry that has a really strange structure that makes no sense to the outsider. <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I, <laughs> I, I think that whatever is done, whatever money comes in, we just need to, yeah, again, work collectively to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And, you know, that there are some people that don't have loud voices during this time that we might need to advocate for and, um, just be thinking about all those people that, that mm -hmm. yep absolutely and um you know with that point um bodies like music victoria are um like doing so much ad advocacy and um it's absolutely worth engaging with um with the australian music industry network um to uh yeah to to have that connection to the rest of the industry they're amazing um advocates in, in that sense um, Nick, um, I, I've got a question from um, Jaden who um, wanted to know more about your comments regarding sharing the risk with artists and potential bonuses. Have agents been receptive to that model? Yeah, I, I think in the current situation that we're in, everyone's receptive to everything. Um, I found that everyone's been really collaborative and approaching it from a collaborative angle. And, you know, sort of what Emily said, with wanting to drive the whole ecosystem, people aren't operating as as silos everyone needs to work together for this thing to get going again so we've had some really positive conversations um with agents here and overseas great do we um do we have any musicians um in the audience who have any thoughts or, or questions they wanted to um throw out there remember to unmute yourself <laughs> I'm here, but I don't know that I have anything to contribute. I've just been listening. <laughs> That's all right. Great to hear from you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there's a question, I can try and contribute, but I don't really play a lot of festivals, so I'm kind of on a smaller scale. Sure. Yeah. So you probably, the this whole discussion around, um, you know, yeah, the, the smaller venues, um, even regional touring as well, um, you know, uh, focusing a bit more of a spread um out and about might that that um does that like is that appealing from from a musician's point of view such as this totally stuff? yeah and that's what we've been talking about at music victoria as well like mm -hmm. how how we can kind of get get networks built um yeah. there have been some kind of test cases i guess over the past few years like up the guts and um there'd be you know people that really like Joe from Bedroom Suck that know those um, trails really well that could probably help, you know, make some of these routes happen. Yep, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, Chris McEwen um, very enthusiastically says, we just want to get back on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Likewise, um, we all want to see you out there as well. Um, 
Um, Andrew also um, saying the problem with government funding is that um, it is um, sometimes because of grant writing um, contest. Yes, the same people and companies normally get the grants. It's hard to leave people behind in that game. Absolutely. Um, and Andrew, did you like? Did you want to expand on that a bit further? Mute. <laughs> you're, on, you're on mute there. Mm. Having a bit of trouble hearing you there. I think because your headphones are plugged in. Uh, how's that? Is that better? There we go. Success. <laughs> um, all, the, all that trouble to say, no, not really. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> a lot more to add on that. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, that um, in a lot of situations with the grant writing, you know, if you're good at it, which, you know, some people fortunately are, and, and I've been lucky a couple of times, so it's, it's not uh, sour grapes, that's for sure. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of people that are outside of the, the, the system, if you like, and, and in that idea of not leaving people behind, um, how to bring um, those people who are, you know, not familiar with writing grant applications every, every couple of years or every year or five times per year, how to bring them into the system because, you know, I totally agree that um, it is easy to leave people behind um, and nobody wants that. So mm. I, that's really all I want to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have we got any more questions for everyone? Don't be shy. Um, throw them out there, either through chat or, or um, unmute if you've got any questions or any thoughts or insights. Have a think about it. Um, am I able to say something? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hello. Um, I'm from so I'm from uh, Central Gippsland. So I live in a town of five thousand people, and I think definitely one of my big thinkings in terms of regional touring, um, a it's a fabulous thing, and I've seen you know the kids here, especially music, is such an amazing thing to bring to regional Victoria because it is hard to get into the big cities and and whatnot but um i think one of the things is um we don't want to bring covid into our small communities because we don't have the resources to cope with it like the the major hospital here has three vendors oh that's yeah. a good case for that okay, so i think that's one of the thinkings as well sorry could you just repeat that last bit i think it cut out a little bit uh, and i think it might have been important <laughs> uh, sorry <laughs> um i was saying how our our um, big hospital here in Sale has three ventilators. So that's kind of, you know, not gonna be good if, if anything happens, you know, if an artist who's just, you know, done a national tour and then comes to a small area, mm. you know, and it's, it could go really bad. Yeah. Um, Matt, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, re like regional areas for Parla or um, like capacity building for um, regional areas uh, in terms of activating more smaller spaces for local artists to um to access and yeah to maybe set up a bit of a regional touring network what were your thoughts there um well regional has always been the biggest part of our business mm. certainly in australia so it's almost 70 percent last year were regional shows um so um there you know and that's that was one of the um sort of magic moments when we when we launched our platform we saw all these people you know outside of the city um admittedly where we didn't live um that wanted live music wanted quality acts to come and play and were willing to pay for the experience um and and so it's it's always been a really um big part and, and certainly with all the applications and gigs that are going on sale now for really for sort of august onwards um, again most of them are in regional areas um so I'm not sure if that's just how our business has always been or yeah. And, but I, you know, to me, um, it's so, um, I don't want to say underappreciated, but you know, um, often artists will be like, I can't, you know, or fans will say, I can't believe, you know, um, mm. whoever is coming to my town, it's unbelievable playing for me mm. and my friends. Um, and you have such a lasting impact as an artist when you do that. Um, um, especially and, and weirdly, like it, it seems that the smaller show the, and, and, you know, the parlor gigs can have more of a vibe to them than sometimes when the artist comes to the, the small theatre in the town. 
where it can be difficult to sell tickets and for, for whatever reason, they can just be challenging. So, um, yeah, um, we're, again, we're hopeful that we just see lots more of that, um, you know, if everything continues to go in the right direction. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there was a question, um, Emily, you, you may or may not know, um, when do we think international artists will be touring here again? Any of the panel care to put a date on it? Uh, Nick, Nick, you have a date. It's for Beyond the Valley in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, we, you know, we've got international acts confirmed. Um, and we're keeping really hopeful but we're also realistic and we've got you know internal cutoff dates that if it's not going to work out we discuss with the artist teams they're just going to jump into next year's event we've already done the negotiating in the back and forth so we'll save ourselves some time mm. the next year nobody nobody knows the answer to that i guess is the question yeah. and, and the other thing to you know in terms of um america <laughs> um that that is a question that nobody can answer right now. I don't know when, you know, the the situation over there is obviously um, escalating every day um, for all sorts of reasons <laughs> that are even not related to the pandemic. So um, whenever, you know, certainly whenever I start thinking like, oh, maybe someone will make it by, you know, blah, blah, you know, you just go, it's just such a um, heightened moment over there that I just it, it feels like almost important you know I think thinking about things like um you know if you if you want to bring an Icelandic artist out I'm sure now would be a great time they have uh they've or you know New Zealanders can come over or um but yeah there's certain territories that um you know we don't we don't let people bring fruit and nuts into this country we're not you know letting people experiencing the pandemic at the level that a place like America is. I just can't see how that, yeah, that's going to be viable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, look, guys, um, we might wrap it up there, but just like, just as a bit of a, um, to bring everything to a close, obviously this, this is a big question to ask in terms of touring. There are so many unknowns still out there. There's a lot of questions we can't answer quite yet. Um, you know, it has been, uh, the last three months have been, completely devastating for so many people in in this touring sector um and but you know within all of that um people have been really innovative in how to respond to this we've seen some really interesting um uh, new approaches to to consuming live music coming up um and you know looking forward um there's there's a lot that can be done um, in terms of government advocacy. Um, there's uh, there's a real need for this sector in particular, with all these moving parts to come together. Um, and also, I think uh, you know there's there's more of a focus on um, at least you know for the kind of short term. There's this focus on Australian content, which is great, and also you know the the possibility to um, redirect funding and focus and work into regional areas as well, I think is a, is a real positive. So um, look, if, if any of the panelists wanted to um, throw in one more kind of thought, um, actually, I did have one last question for, for all of you, um, which is, you know, you might not have the answer just yet, but um, I wanted to know what, what is it gonna be like for you when you get back to your first proper gig? Emily, do you? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, well, it'll be great. It'll be, um, I'm trying to, I, we were actually, I was walking on Smith Street the other day. I might have done something illegal. So if I disclose something, <laughs> don't tell anyone. Um, but uh, we were walking on Smith Street and um, walked past Plug 7 and um, saw like a band just setting up and I was just like, got all like, oh, what's going on? And it was, um, great Coburg funk band surprise chef setting up to do a live stream and I we I popped in I kind of banged on the door and and went in and um so I sort of sat in yeah there were about three of us but it was just this really lovely um you know it was 7 p.m I didn't have to stand up too long see I, I have other issues with live gigs which are you know not related to COVID-19 <laughs> which I won't go into um but that was um that was so I mean I, I was saying on the night I the last show I went to was new order at the music bowl and then my first kind of show back was this like little in store at a record store and um that was quite quite
quite a, a lovely moment, but um, can't imagine what it will be like getting in the club. I don't know, are we all going to be germaphobes? Like, are, are we going to want to be close to each other anymore? I'm not sure. I'm going to hug the sub, like, the moment that I walk in. I just, like, just lay on it, just, just give it a big cuddle or something like that, surely. But have you seen those, uh, have you guys seen those smoke machines that, um, that what's it called, uh, that spray the disinfectant smoke or oh, what no. antibacterial <laughs> smoke like it was it's so weird it's like a normal smoke machine that like sprays out antibacterial compounds within the um what's it called um within the yeah. smoke so i was just like we just got to invest in a few of those just at every show Good idea. what a time <laughs> what a time to be yeah. alive matt i imagine um i imagine your first gig back might be a little intimate one in line with everything that you do with pie, maybe? <laughs> well, I love going to other shows as well. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like Emily, I like to sit down as well. Um, I don't consider myself old, but <laughs> I, I feel like I enjoy it a lot more. Um, but so the first show that I'm got, I've got tickets to is a parlor gig out here in the Yarra Valley where I live. Um, Harry James Angus is coming to my town. <laughs> um, not because I'm hosting him. There's someone else that I don't know here that's hosting him and I got invited, so I bought a ticket. Um, so right. I'm, I think, and I think that'll be really, um, wonderful and emotional and, um, we've got a COVID-19 protocol where people have to, you know, physical distance and sanitize their hands and stuff. Um, so I'm going to go anonymously and not, you know, like people don't know that I am from parlor. Um, cause I don't want to like freak out if people are acting irresponsibly, <laughs> <for sure. laughs> but, um, I, I trust people's good judgment. I haven't really seen any, um, bad behavior out and about um people seem to be it's really interesting i was gonna say the handshake is dead isn't it it's gone i'm all for the foot taps now <laughs> <laughs> the elbow tap and the, yeah. the kiss hello it's gone it's very weird yeah totally anyway. yeah. mick are you uh, are you going to be in a massive mosh pit somewhere at a big festival <laughs> um we've, we've got a really tight knit like family team in the office and i can see a moment like whether it's Beyond the Valley after the countdown or at our first tour or day party with, you know, the whole office sort of huddled together, having a really big cry about what we've just gone through in the last So much months. ugly crying going on. <laughs> 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 I mean, I ugly cried at um, concerts anyway, so it won't be much of a change for me. <laughs> Alas. Um, look, guys, uh, I also just wanted to quickly shout before we wrap up that... Um, uh, Music Victoria um, are offering free memberships until June 30th. So um, make sure you snap one of those up um, for yourself, your band, your venue, your festival. Um, you know, we were saying before about um, how we all stay connected. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate that bodies, uh, organisations like Music Victoria um, uh, certainly play that role and provide so many um, excellent resources and um, a pathway for connecting with the rest of the industry and with government. So, um, yeah, so I, um, I really encourage everybody um, to, to grab a free membership while they're going. Um, and look, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. I just wanted to thank um, Music Victoria again. I wanted to thank our panellists. Thank you so much for your insights, um, for your honesty. Um, yeah, for coming together and, you know, sharing some hard times and some positive thoughts as well. Um, and thanks to everyone here for coming. Um, look out for the recording of this video again um, on Music Victoria's Facebook. Um, and yeah, we'll hopefully all be ugly crying together soon at a concert. <laughs> Can't wait. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks a Can't lot. Can't wait. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you so much for hosting us.